Hey! <laughs> we have arrived. Good morning, church. <laughs> Welcome for everyone here, whether you're with us in person today or whether you're just joining us online today, we welcome you into God's grace, God's mercy, and into God's house with us here today. And this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be, and glad. be glad in it. Hey, we uh, we had some snow come in. I don't know if anybody you know recognized the fact that there's all this white stuff on the ground. But you know, one of the neat things that I like about it is it was hard to look a little bit dirty and dingy and everything out there. You get this fresh, white, clean look going on out there with all this fresh snow and everything. So it's, it's kind of something to look forward to, to, to cover up all the dirt and the nasty stuff in the world and to make it look fresh and new and clean again. And that's the kind of thing we have in Christ Jesus. <coughs> he takes all the dirt and all the nasty stuff <coughs> and all the sins of the world and he makes them clean as snow. So welcome again, once again. And hey, this Wednesday night, we had our group study session. We had an awesome discussion this last Wednesday. Lots of insights and things. And we welcome you to join us then again this uh, coming Wednesday at 7 o'clock p.m. right here. Same bat place, same bat channel. And uh, to have a, a nice uh, get together and talk about miracles and what they mean in the world today and what they look like. Because a lot of times we, we kind of lose track and lose sight of what these miracles are all about. February 12th is coming up on us very quickly. Uh, we have like a month, or actually less than a month to go now. Orange track racing starts its 17th season. And so we got that to look forward to. And coming up in March, we have another movie and we invite you to Give us some suggestions on something that you would like to see. Um, and uh, I'll be making a listing of all of the movies that we have in our library. And I just uh, was telling Pastor Terry this morning that I added on another four films to that series here just in the last week. So I'm waiting for them to arrive. So we got a lot of new and great things going on here at Great Street Church. And we are uh, searching for a new home. Our lease ended in December. And so we will be looking to uh, move out there. They're possibly going to have a beauty salon move into this stand here. So we're on a month-to-month -month basis right now, uh, searching for a new home and, and uh, uh, hope to have that resolved fairly quickly here. So let's open our time of worship with prayer. Let's go to God right now. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for being here with us in this space right here, right now and for residing in our hearts every day through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, even though the world comes at us from all different directions, the neat thing is, is Lord, you're in there in the midst of us to help us through and to see us through. No matter what uh, struggle we have, no matter what strife we have going on, health issues, Lord, you're there with us all the time. And through the power of your Holy Spirit, we can rest assured that you are in control, that you are there to see us through. Lord God, we pray for those who can't be with us here today, whether they uh, are plagued with an illness right now or whether they're traveling, Lord, that we just lift them up to you and we ask that you uh, give them blessings of peace and comfort and healing. And Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to hear your word of you as you've inspired Pastor Terry this morning uh, with the words that you have put upon his heart, that he could share those words with us today and that we would be blessed by hearing them. So open our hearts, Lord, to receive your word today. Open our ears to hear and our eyes to see the miracles that surround us as we talk about our miracles of community today. Thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity and for your blessings on us today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So our call to worship today uh, comes from 1 Corinthians 1.10 from the New Living Translation. And it says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. 
Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and in purpose. And I can't think of anything that is uh, more necessary in the times that we face today because we seem to be tugged in every which direction. And if we uh, align ourselves to the world, then we're going to get separated from God in the process. And when we look at when Paul wrote this to uh, the Corinthians, the church in Corinth, uh, Corinth, the city of Corinth is at a crossroads, and literally, because it is one of the major trade centers of the region. And as such, it was a hotbed of moral decay and corruption. First Corinthians calls all Christians to be careful not to blend in with the world and accept its lifestyles and values. We must live Christ-centered, blameless, loving lives that make a difference for God. That's what we're called to do. You know, you always hear about that, what is my purpose in life? Well, that is exactly it. That's what we were created by God to do, is to live that Christ-centered life and live loving lives that make a difference for God. We are literally God's hands and feet in this world. And as you think about this passage that I just got done reading to you, take time to examine your values in light of your commitment to Christ, your commitment to the body of Christ, the church. Are you a living example of what Christ has called you to be, or are you letting things distract you from being committed to the church? So I want you to think about that today as you listen to Pastor Terry's message as he talks about the miracle of community. Well, good morning. Hopefully all of you thought out just a little bit here. Uh, yesterday was quite the, uh, the snow event that we got to clean up after. This morning we continue with week two of the miracle of community. And last week, Pastor Mark started us off on that journey looking at miracles. Now we began by looking at some of the miraculous moments recorded for us in the Gospels. But we also looked at the overarching miracle of God's love in our lives. The ways God takes our commonplace, everyday lives and sets them apart as holy. Now today, as we continue that journey, we're going to look at the miracle of community. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to hear your word this morning, the words that you have provided, Father, not ours, but yours. For the thoughts that have come to mind as we've read the scriptures and gone over uh, this topic of the miracle of community, Father, we just ask for open hearts, open minds, and also for the willingness to take that message and put it into practice. Father, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this morning, let's be, I want to begin by asking a question that may sound a bit strange at first, but just simply bear with me. When you think about it, and this is kind of a touchy question, especially in light of today's, uh, the way that the last few years has been going for us, what are today's greatest health issues? Every day we hear new reports of of uh, not just the COVID pandemic, but we're hearing about there's viruses that are being spread by mosquitoes, highly contagious diseases that uh, beyond COVID that are devastating entire countries. But there's also the things that have been around for years, diabetes, cancer, and so many others. We hear of loved ones with COVID, cancer, or other diseases. And sadly, we hear about those who have died from those. Some all together too young. Sometimes it's expected. Sometimes it's unexpected. And you know what? It doesn't matter. 
they both hurt just as much. Now, over the last several years, some of the things that have been uh, really in the news and, and on the rise are health issues that center around obesity and, and mental health. And you know, I, I find it interesting, there are, in other countries, they don't have ads on TV for drugs, for the, for the different kinds of medicines that are out there. In fact, they look at, if someone comes from another country and is watching TV with you, or they look at these ads, they say, what on earth is that about? It is what it is. But our TV and our social media are just full of those. But by the same token, they're out there and they're bringing attention to these issues. Now, the specific issue that I really have seen a lot on recently are mental health issues. Now, in a recent study, scientists have pointed to another health issue. A little less obvious than these, but one that we've been experiencing in epidemic proportions over the last couple of years. That epidemic? Loneliness. A new report called Loneliness in America, and this is uh, done by the Making Caring Common Project comes out of Harvard Graduate School of Education. It suggests that 36% of all Americans feel not just loneliness, but serious loneliness. So if 36% are experiencing serious loneliness, the, those that are experiencing some form of loneliness has to be much larger. And in this study, it found that 61% of young adults and 51% of mothers with young children feel this serious loneliness. And it's only been made worse by this global COVID pandemic. 43% of those young people have reported an increase in loneliness since the start of the pandemic. We've been shut off from our peers and our friends and our families through this. Roughly half of lonely young adults reported that no one has taken even a few minutes, let alone more than a few minutes, to make them feel genuinely cared about. Think about that. They don't feel genuinely cared about something that as Christians we're called to do. 63% of young adults are suffering significant symptoms of anxiety or depression. These are huge numbers. And this is just from young people. This doesn't include us middle-aged folks or even our parents who are, are much older. It's a multi-generational problem. And this is a quote that came out of the Loneliness in America uh, report. It says, we need to return to an idea that was central to our founding and is at the heart of many great religious traditions. It should have just crossed that up at the heart of Christianity, because of, but I digress. We have commitments to ourselves, but we also have vital commitments to each other, including to those who are vulnerable. Think about what the scriptures tell us about the widows and the orphans. A 2015 study in the journal Perspectives on Psychological Science found that the subjective feeling of loneliness increases the risk of death by 26%. The Campaign to End Loneliness reports that lacking social connections is a comparable risk factor for early death and it's equivalent to smoking 15, this is well over half a pack of cigarettes, a day. And it's worse for us than well-known risk factors such as obesity and the lack of physical activity. That's huge. 
It's all ironic to me, but true, that although we live in a culture that is increasingly connected by technology and social media, we are increasingly lonely. We need each other. And it's not just to be in close proximity of one another, although that can help, but we need to have deep connections with one another. Pastor Mark and I were talking about that this morning when we were talking about getting men's and women's groups started. And I looked at him and said, well, we can work on the men's group part of that, but since the women think completely differently than we do, we'll let, we have to let them do that. We need to find a, a leader there that can figure that one out because well, we just don't think the same. We gather around food. I'm not sure what the women will gather around. Maybe shopping? Maybe pennies? Although I know you guys did that once. We did it last time. But you can do it again, too. <laughs> While loneliness is at an epidemic health issue and, and it may be new news to you, the fact is, is needing each one another is nothing new at all. It's the way that we were created. We were created to be people of relationship and community. We need it physically, we need it emotionally, and we need it spiritually. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 10, 24 and 25. It says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. And when this was written... <laughs> some 2,000 years ago, talking about his return drawing near. That means we're 2,000 years closer to his return. It's all the more important. And, and this is about thoughtful acts of love and good works. And those characterize true Christian commitment. Now, at the time, Paul was warning Christians not to go neglect meeting because of persecution, because persecution was on the uprise then. But today, there's things far more than just persecution that we use as excuses to neglect the meeting with one another. It's my only day to sleep in, Pastor. I'm sorry, my kid or my kids, we've got a gamer. We've got this tournament we need to go to because this is the day that they have them and they start at eight or nine o'clock in the morning. We have to be there or they can't play high school sports because they'll be so far behind. And the list goes on and on and on. And as that time of Jesus' return gets closer and closer, it's more important than ever for us to come together and meet. We need to faithfully, in grace and love, encourage each other to meet together. Authentic community will break. I wrote can break, but no, it will break the cycle of loneliness and isolation. Now, as we experience community, we have the unique opportunity to extend this miracle into the lives of others around us. See, God created us to be part of the body of Christ. Paul writes about this in Romans 12, 4 and 5. He says, just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. And here's the question. How does knowing that we belong to each other change the way that we live? I've got an example for you, and this is from the movie that we saw uh, a week ago, Miracles from Heaven. And in this video clip, the family has sat down to have a pizza dinner. Oops, their sound bar's off. Technical moment, please. So then I won't have it either. Well, I'm happy. 
believe it's a great idea. I'm in. They do. Ever? You're not going to have pizza ever? Well, until it has better. Well, my body's still growing. <laughs> Wrong answer. Jeez. It's okay, Adam. You're only six, no pressure. I love that part. Ever? You're not going to eat pizza ever? When the movie Anne and the Middle Sister, who's the one that's suffering from severe intestinal problems, she hasn't been able to keep food down for weeks. And the doctors have run tests after tests, prescribed medications. She's been referred from one doctor to another. Her parents have taken her to appointment after appointment. And at this point in the movie, one of the specialists suggested that maybe Anna is lactose intolerant. So now, on top of everything else, she has dietary restrictions. She can't have any dairy in. Well, Cheese. Primary part that I, most of us eat pizza is cheese, and even the crust. Both have lactose in them. Now Anna, as we have seen, or as we saw in the movie, has a very loving family. And in this book, we see the oldest sister take that very simple step of standing with the, her younger sister by choosing to give up the same food that she does. Have you ever done that with a family member? Because they can't have it, you don't either. Community, it doesn't have to be spectacular or extravagant. It can be very simple. It can mean seeing a need that someone has, like we saw in this clip, and choosing to walk alongside them through that struggle to join them. It's a simple act that lessens the isolation that person may be feeling for themselves. We see that happen when Abby, the oldest sister, simply says, if Anna can't have pizza, I won't eat it either. Simple decision, put her desires to the side in order to support her younger sister. So she doesn't have to deal with it alone. She reaches out and she doesn't just come alongside her sister. She brings her whole family along that same journey. It's not anything that's complicated. It's not difficult. The truth is though, it's not always easy. Would you be willing to give up pizza? I love my pizza. I don't But would you be willing to do that to a family member or a friend? We've seen videos on, on social media where uh, someone's getting a, a haircut or giving their hair shape because they have cancer, They're just taking it off. And the person doing it, probably not a barber because it's not really necessary because you're taking the whole thing off, not doing anything fancy. But then that person in that video does the same thing, just takes all their hair off too. The emotions that run in that those videos is high. If we are honest, we're often more like the youngest sister, though, who quickly see what that sacrifice is going to require of us. That sacrifice almost always overshadows the benefit of the other, for the other person. Adeline says, ever? You won't eat pizza ever? And I'm thinking about a six-year-old saying that and the, just the way their tone is that it just sticks. The cost of supporting her sister was almost too great for her. 
I love the reasons that she came up with. You know, she's a growing girl after all. She needs to eat. But they all encouraged her and they decided to all stand together instead of leaving Anna alone in isolation. And while the situations you face may have nothing to do with pizza and may seem far more overwhelming than giving up cheese, the principles of community are the same. Every single day we have opportunities to choose community over isolation. And when we open our eyes to the needs around us, the needs of the people around us, and we are willing to sacrifice our own comfort for the benefit of others, we can begin to create true community. So let's talk about that a little bit, but let's look at it from the point of biblical community. The Bible gives us various pictures of living in community. Jesus' disciples lived and learned together. And the early church in Acts shared all they had and cared for one another. And when we think of making tough choices to live in community rather than isolation, perhaps one of the most poignant stories comes from the Old Testament. And that's the account of Ruth and Naomi. Naomi's life, you remember, is marked by tragedy and loneliness. Famine, the loss of her husband, and both her sons. So all she has left are herself and her two daughters-in-law. Now at this point, she's widowed and feeling too old to find another husband, so she wouldn't be able to bear more children for her daughters-in-law to eventually marry because they're not going to wait that long. So she urges her daughters-in-law to return to their homes and families where they could create a new life for themselves. Now in their culture, marriage and bearing children are their only hope for prosperity. And Naomi recognizes that there is little hope for herself. She's got nothing and she decides that she's going to be alone. But that doesn't have to be the case. At the moment of terrible loss and isolation, Naomi's daughter-in-law, Ruth, makes a selfless commitment to her. Listen to those now famous words coming from Ruth 1, 16 and 18. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, and she stopped urging her not to. Ruth chose to go with Naomi, and she chose for them to be together. She chose for them to be together in community. And her words have come to represent the ultimate commitment to another person. The book of Ruth is a beautiful picture of choosing to be the miracle of community to someone else. But see, the story doesn't stop there. With help from Naomi, Ruth is later married to a man named Boaz, and she gives birth to a son. And through her commitment, she and Naomi are both drawn into a new family. And that family becomes part of the bigger story. The genealogy of King David and eventually Jesus. The miracle community is that it turns the table on loneliness and isolation. It ushers us into a meaningful, life-giving relationship with others and with God. Now, it might not immediately cure the problem, it might not immediately take care of the underlying issues that lead to loneliness, but choosing community opens the door to allow God to work in our lives and in the lives of others. There are three keys to community. Number one, we have to be committed. So your commitment to another may be a momentary choice to come alongside them in a specific situation, as the family did in the movie Over Pizza. It may be a choice to commit yourself over and over to sharing life together, no matter the cost. 
Community always <clears throat> requires commitment to living with our <clears throat> eyes and hearts open to the needs of others. We have to have look through the God's lens, see how He sees. Community itself literally means with unity. That means we don't have to do it alone. And we can't. We can't do it alone. Listen to the encouragement you get from Paul in his letter to the Ephesians in Ephesians 4 and 3. From the New Living Translation says this, Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. You see, it's an ongoing process. It's not something you can just do one day and not the next. Community isn't just about social activities and having a good time. It's much deeper than that. We have to have much deeper relationships. And although those social events, like coming to a movie or going to Orange Track or, or what have you, there are things that are more important to drive those relationships to go even deeper. Galatians 6 and 2 says this out of the Amplified Version. says, Carry one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the requirements of the law of Christ. That is, the law of Christian love. See, Jesus teaches us that this includes not only loving our neighbors, but also our enemies. That's the hard part, loving our enemies. But let's look at some practical ideas of how this looks. And Paul writes in Romans 12, 10, and 18, he says, Love each other with genuine affection or authentic affection. And we almost have to think of this as members of one family. He goes on to say, and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. He goes on to say, rejoice in our confident hope. And it's not just a single rejoicing, it is a constant rejoicing. He says, be patient in trouble and keep on praying. And by that, I think he means to continually seek wisdom guidance and strength through that prayer. See, when God's people are in need, he continues, he says, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy. In other words, share in their joy. And weep with those who weep by sharing in their grief. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud. In other words, don't be conceited or self-important or exclusive from others. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. There is nothing convenient about these actions. They require a little thing called commitment. Those of you who are married know all about these aren't necessarily convenient things that you do in your relationship with your spouse. And they do require commitment. But look at the love that comes out of that. Look at what comes out of that relationship. And it, all, it really leads us into our second point, because we have to be selfless. Community is worth it, but it's not without cost. And while we often try to combat loneliness by doing things for ourselves, or getting ahead, uh, maybe going on that shopping spree to buy something for ourselves, God's truth suggests another way. John 15, 12, and 13 in the Amplified Version says this, This is my commandment, that you love and unselfishly seek the best for one another, just as I have loved you. No one has greater love nor stronger commitment than to lay down his own life for his friends. So you see, when we choose to lay down our lives for others, we are obeying Jesus' commandment. And in doing so, Jesus says, we become his friends. Listen to what he says here in John 15, 14, 
in uh, 15 of the New International Version. It says, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You see, it's a selfless act of choosing to love others that brings us into closer relationship, not just with them, but with Christ. In fact, when we selflessly love others, we are showing our love for God. Listen to these words from Matthew, out of 20, uh, Matthew 25, 34 through 40. It says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Community calls us to love and serve each other, especially those in need. And there is a supernatural twist in doing this. It's a miraculous twist. God sees and gathers our actions to himself, and he blesses them and counts them as love. God sees those acts as our love. He turns the most human of our intentions into heavenly connections. But in doing so, we have to do what comes to be our third point, which is be patient. We have to pursue community through commitment and selflessness. But don't be surprised that it doesn't come with all the warm fuzzies. Remember, I said it wasn't going to be easy. Anyone who has lived in true community knows this. Community requires patience. If you've seen the movie, the movie Evan Almighty, when God is talking to Evan's wife, and she says, I don't know why God doesn't just give me patience. And Morgan Freeman playing God says, did you ever think that God was giving you opportunities to be patient? Careful when you ask for when you pray for patience. But community is not about perfection. It is about that patience, and it's patience with one another, because as we are patient with one another, we're going through a time of learning and growing together. It takes work. Jesus had many opportunities to demonstrate patience with his disciples. If you go back and reread the Gospels, you're going to see over and over again how they misunderstood or they asked Jesus, what did you mean? I don't get it. And when they would misunderstand, sometimes that would get them all fired up. Sometimes, if, when we misunderstand a, a situation, think about how upset you get when you don't realize all that is going on in that situation. But also think about the times that the disciples were with Jesus and they just simply fell asleep. They weren't didn't always get it. But through Jesus' toughest moments on his journey from his birth to the cross, they were still there. And while they weren't perfect, they were there. They didn't do things perfectly the way that you know, maybe somebody thought they should, but they were always there. They didn't always act the way they should, but they were always there. And Jesus modeled patience for us. Because he got frustrated with them too. But they were still together. And despite all their flaws, Jesus chose that close community with his disciples over going at it alone. If he had gone at it alone, what would have happened? Would anybody have gone out and continued to spread the message? I highly doubt it. 
He knew that in relationship and community that his love would be demonstrated and his message would be lived out before a world that he longs to draw to community with himself. When we commit to community, we commit to patience with one another. <coughs> Listen to the, what Paul wrote the Ephesians of, or the Thessalonians, the first Thessalonians 5.14. He says, Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy, encourage those who are timid, and take tender care of those who are weak. And then he finishes it with this. Be patient with everyone. That's a tough calling. And just as we hope that others will be patient with us, we are required to extend that same patience to them. It's not complicated. We don't have to be perfect in doing it, but we have to be patient. And in our world, where loneliness and isolation comes naturally, we have to work together in community. But in our simple choices to stand with others, we open the door to the miracle of community. When we stand with others, God promises he is there with us. Listen to what Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew 18, 20. He says, For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. Now today we are small. Here in person, we've got some folks who are traveling. We had one who had a COVID scare. And we do have uh, some folks who are positive. But we also have all these wonderful people that are joining us online. We're all together. Jesus is here amongst us. That's miraculous that he is in our presence so that we can say God is here with us. See, community, this community that we've been talking about has amazing potential to be life-changing for those who are lonely and struggling. It has the amazing potential to be life-changing for you and for me as we face our own loneliness and struggles. I've been working from home since March of 2020. I sit down in the basement, there's nothing, there's no other interaction with people. It gets lonely. The fact that I get to talk to people on the phone helps with that, but it doesn't get to that personal relationships that we all need. You can be a miracle in someone's life this week. Where do you see a need in the life of someone you know? And I leave you with this question. Will you stand with that person like Anna's family did when they said they wouldn't eat pizza again? Will you stand with that person and make the choice to usher in the miracle of community in the world around you? Heavenly Father, you've given us a lot to think about through this message, Father. This miracle of community. But you've shown us over and over again throughout the Old and New Testaments how important that community is. And while we may want to just hide and not be around others, it's not healthy for us. In fact, it's it's just as bad as some of the bad habits that, that we have with our health. Father, help us to let go of this want to sometimes be alone because it only hurts us. Let us grow together in community. Let us strive to be the people that you called us to be. And as Paul wrote in our call to worship this morning, let us live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in our church family. Let us be united in one mind, united in thought and in purpose. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Terry. As we come into the
this time of communion together, the act of communion is a sacred moment when we gather together with God and with Jesus, that we recommit ourselves to God during this sacrament, this sacred event that we do. And it is called communion because it brings us together with God and with each other as we take communion as a group. That is why it's called communion. It is the base of community. It is a gathering together. As the disciples and Jesus gathered together in the, in the upper room the night that they had the, the dinner, the supper together, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he said, This is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. Later in the meal, he took the cup and he filled it. And after he blessed it, he said, This is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And each time the scripture tells us that we come together, we are to break bread. We are to celebrate this meal, God with us, in communion with each other the body and the blood of Christ. And we are to do so until he returns again. So let us gather together in community, being of one mind in Christ today, the body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, you have spoken to us today. You have spoken into our hearts. You have spoken into our minds. Help us to receive your word today, Lord. Not to put it away, not to just simply store it, but to live it out each and every day. Help us to live in community with each other. Help us to live in communion with you. You in our hearts you in our lives, you in our minds, guiding and directing us in our steps each and every day, that we can be your light shining in this community, that we can be your hands and feet serving this community. Lord, that we can be your brothers and sisters in Christ, your children, coming to meet and greet other brothers and sisters in Christ and to bring them home in community with you. Thank you, Lord God, for the blessings of community. Thank you, Lord God, that you send your Holy Spirit to commune and to dwell within our hearts, within our lives, to guide and direct us in our steps as we seek to have that relationship with you. Thank you, Father God, in all these things, in Christ Jesus' name we pray. So as we come into this time for prayers with people, uh, we talked about at the very beginning of the service that we had some of the people who are traveling. We ask travel mercies on them today. We have some of those who have uh, just come back from traveling and unfortunately have tested positive for COVID now. So they're having to stay at home. Others who are feeling under the weather and who are honoring us by staying at home so in case they do have uh, COVID or anything like that, that they will not be uh, sharing it with the rest of our community here. So we thank them for that. We also ask them and ask blessings upon them today. Is there anyone else who has any other prayers or uh, absolute God sightings that we've seen this week um, that we can share with the rest of the community? Let's go to God in prayer. 
Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to lift these people up, to come in and intercede on your behalf so that we can lift them up to you and so they can come back wholly restored in health and wholly restored in their travels that they come home safely. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of time to be able to get away, to be able to recharge, regroup, so that when they come back, they can rejoin and be in communion with everyone else. Thank you, Lord God, for the blessings that you give us each and every day, for the God sightings that pop up before us as we drive down the street and we see neighbors shoveling out neighbors' drives in the middle of the snow or getting them unstuck from a situation where their car is stuck in the snow, Lord. It's the little things that are miracles that you put others in our path, in our lives, to show your grace and mercy at work and alive in our world today. Thank you, Lord God, for these blessings. Thank you, Lord, for being here with us as we have gathered in your name today. Amen. With Pastor Bruce and Shannon being on the road traveling, we do continue to pray for their travel mercies. But that's why today we haven't had any live music. So uh, those of you who are watching online, we're about to close out this portion of our service since we can't show those videos online. But I'm going to leave you with, with this. God wants us to be in community. And when you think about the last point of the, of the sermon today, where it says to be patient, think about how patient God has been with you. you don't have to worry about anybody else. Worry, at this point, just think about how he, I know how he's been patient with me. I know how he was patient with me years ago. I know how he was patient with me two hours ago. I know how he's patient with me right now. It's constant. Gives us and models for us how we should love our friends, love our family, love our enemies, and be patient and to live with them in community. We need to come alongside them. Father, we just thank you that you have made us for peace and community and love and grace and mercy and forgiveness. Let those things live in our hearts, Father. Let us show them to everyone we meet. Let us be patient with those in our circles. Let us live in community. Let us strive and desire to live in community with one another. And as we do that, I pray that we would not just see what's going on in somebody's life, but also to listen to what they're saying that they're going through. Help us to be empathetic to the things that they're going through. Help us to be joyful when they are joyful and to be with them when they are not, when they're in grief. Thank you, Father, that you have given us lesson after lesson so that we could learn this. In Jesus' name, amen. And I leave you with this blessing that the Lord said to Moses for Aaron and his sons to give to the people of Israel and us, because it's more, it's for us as well. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Go in peace.